we can get the loaded and all that good stuff. Um, just a delightful, beautiful day. The summer is marching on, going too fast, as it always does. Um, let's see, as far as housekeeping items, uh, we have another brunch this Sunday, and then one after that. The council does one in a couple of weeks. We've got a couple brunches on Sunday morning, so don't forget about that. Um, worship is going well. Yeah, that was just a great worship service last Sunday, I thought. A lot of people talking about it. I mean, the sermon. <laughs> Except for the sermons, the music was great. Yeah, yeah you know, it can't be all good. Um, <laughs> Wasn't that something, Adrian Kate? And if you were in the late service, I told we, we've been really cautious about using the screens to project what's going on in the service because you don't really need it. It's not that big, you know. If you go to a big, big, huge hall, they'll have a speaker up there on the screens, and we, we, we. But I said to Annika, I said, you know what? It'd be cool to project Adrian playing up there so people could see him better. We did that in the second service, and people loved it. Yes. Um, well, you know, I actually don't know what what Adrian's up to, but you know his sister is like right there. Oh, you do, yeah. Oh, okay. So he obviously here for the summer. Yeah, I mean you, you're, you're. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're seeing like a national elite piano player right there. Yeah, sure. World, you know, it's yeah, he's amazing. And his sister is, her, you know, I don't know what she's doing and what, you know, where she's at, but as far as, but there, it's amazing. Yeah. Sandy knew Dan. Dan is a principal in Bremerton. And so she knew that's where she got to know the King family originally when she was working in Bremerton School District. So yeah, great Sunday, great worship. If, you, uh, if you're if you listening online, go to our uh, uh, Silverdale Lutheran YouTube channel and uh, check it out. Um, uh, let's see. Um, do we know how many do on? Yeah, we do. Um, I was just looking at the worship attendance because <laughs> I thought before I put my little plug in last Sunday um, about in-person worship, I should uh, I like that. know that. I hope that was received. I, no one's, of course, the, the people that were upset by him really aren't going to come and tell me probably. But anyway, um, we have, Roberta, about 100 people, 200 people. We're, we've kind of leveled off. You know, with some dips and, you know, because of, well, I mean, when COVID really hit a month or two ago, a month ago, we had, you know, a real drop in Sunday morning. But uh, we've been really leveled off at about 200 a Sunday in person. It's It seems like the sanctuary is full with 100 people now. <laughs> because, but it used to be that was a, that would be like a, step, you know, what's going on kind of Sunday. Why isn't people there? Um, we before COVID, we were averaging 375 between both services. So we are about 150 to 200 less in-person worship than we were pre-COVID. But we have between YouTube, Facebook, Live, and our app, Subsplash. A lot of people just watch it on from the website or on their phone. Um, we have about over 100 a Sunday. Yeah. But we don't know if they're just they just clicked on it for two seconds. Well, we that's not true. Facebook, we we use engagements, not clicks. So if we did clicks, we get over a hundred clicks Sunday just Facebook. But the engagements are less. They they people that actually stay a while. So um, so that's our best guess. Yeah, but yeah, it's you know like I mentioned the sermon. The live streaming is going to be forever. Um, homebound people, traveling families, soccer, volleyball. I mean, if, if your kids want to play those games today, they either go, they have to choose church or those games because 
all the tournaments, all the games are on Sunday. So, I mean, it's, it's not like it used to be where you used to have an occasional decision to make. It's every Sunday, swimming, basketball, you know, whatever. It's all on Sunday. So Sunday is no longer a sacred time. So as we know, so we're going to do it that way. You know, there's all kinds of other benefits. Um, but I do, at this, that's why I felt like I needed to say, you know, some churches are pulling the plug on it because they want people to come back. Um, but I don't think that's the answer either. I think the answer is just for us to encourage people when they can to come in. But yeah, we're getting old. Some of us are getting older. We're getting knee replacements and you got to sit, you got to sit behind your TV for two months. You know, I mean, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's something we needed to do that COVID forced us to do. And now we're doing it. And it's great. Financially, we look like at the council meeting, we are just about even meeting our ministry expenses, not the budget, but we're about 85% of the budget. We, our goal is to be 90% of the budget, um, but we are meeting our ministry expenses. We have a lot of more substantial gifts, I guess, in July for various reasons uh, where people will gave more perhaps than they usually do. It seemed like, I don't know what, who gives what, but I just get the report that says, okay, we there were more, there were some special gifts in that. So, um, so that's good though. Meeting your ministry expenses midsummer is not bad. So that's good. So that's the other thing I think that a lot of people on the live stream are finding something helpful and important and they're supporting, they're continuing to support our, the ministry. So, so that's good. Um, you'll see Chris Love is going to be building a beautiful new desk in the back for all the sound equipment, so it won't look shabby anymore. Uh, and it's going to match the finish, you know, of the of the other of the pews and everything, so it looks like it's supposed to be that. And I'm excited about that. And we're getting finally. Well, we have an install date for the new stove, and we have an install date probably next week. If you, if you didn't know, if you come in, you see the lights are on all the time. Uh, the only way for us to turn the lights on and off for the past years is to crawl up to the top and turn them on. So they're all LED bulbs now, so it's not a big deal that it uses up bulbs. But um, because the lighting control system failed, um, back in mid COVID and we, it took forever. Just say to Lisa, Greg, thank you. I heard, <laughs> uh, it just took forever that our insurance company covered it though, which is really cool. So they're paying for the whole, the new system, which is very expensive to do because it's, you couldn't replace the old one. It's so out of, it's 30 years old. So um the our insurance company oh. yeah the church mutual yeah it, it's covered under our you know i don't know it's covered right. under our policy so um so that was a real gift and so we're going to have a a much nicer lighting system that can control and fade and you know for yes. good friday and christmas eve and all of that you don't have to you know do it by hand you know we, we can have different things so that's being installed next week so we'll right. actually be able to turn the lights on and off in the sanctuary again so it's that's that's exciting so there's some good things going there all right so there's your little uh update update your uh your what do you call that <laughs> not current events but um, what's that What's happening? So what's happening? All right, so let's share the screen here. Let's get to this great. Um, actually, let me get get this up here so this records right. Get everybody over here like that, and then I'll stop the share and go right back to it. Um, okay, let's pray. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for a great uh, moment to just delve into your word, and especially this amazing chapter um, and this amazing parable. So let us get as much out of it as possible, Lord. Come to us with your spirit through your word this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I want to just finish up with. Uh, 
a summary or go back and remind us. We've got three parables, parable of the lost sheep, parable of lost coin, and parable of really the lost son would be the best, the best sons would, to make them all three go together as far as titles go. But remember, all three are told why. Why did Jesus tell these parables? According to Luke, now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So that's the problem. That, that's like, why did Jesus tell this parable? Because people were upset that sinners were drawing near to Jesus. That would be Gentiles and prostitutes and tax collectors and unclean people and people those people are coming near to jesus and people that would have been excluded the lame the crippled you know people with disease those people are coming near to jesus and they're upset because jesus is receiving and he's even eating with them that's as we talked about in previous bible studies that's a pretty radical amazing thing so then we get these stories. Now, last week we talked about this word metanoia, repentance. And we struggle in the New Testament with, um, with you know, what we've talked a lot about. It seems like, what is repentance? And last week we got into the whole, do you make a choice? Do you not make a choice? And, and you know, th this type of thing, uh, you know, and how do we language what we do as human beings? Um, so I wanted to um, read a couple concluding remarks from Harry Wentz's uh, Parables of Jesus and Luke, which he bases on Kenneth Bailey's work, a really great Middle Eastern scholar. And so and this is what he says. This brings us to the question of the nature and function of this repentance. For the rabbis, repentance was a precondition for grace. Okay. And he's already gone through all the different rabbinical teachings and, and whatnot. And that's probably the way we often think about it. Well, you got to repent first before you get grace. It was a work by which a righteous person showed himself righteous. So it's something we do, and then we're made righteous or whatever. For first century Judaism, repentance was a way of bringing in the kingdom. Got somebody coming in here? No. Okay. Now, this is what, this is, listen to this. All this is clearly silenced in the parable of the lost sheep. The sheep does nothing to prompt the shepherd to begin his search. Sheep didn't repent. So then God said, okay, I'll come find you now. Except to become lost. <laughs> That's what caused it. In the parable, the shepherd finds the sheep. Then in the conclusion of the parable, there is reported joy over one sinner who repents. Here, being found is equated with repentance. Let me read that again. Being found is equated with repentance. Thus, the parable of the lost sheep sets out a radically new understanding of the nature of repentance. In the preaching of Jesus, repentance was a response to the kingdom already come. So repentance isn't something we have to do to muster ourselves to get ourselves ready for God to accept us. No, God comes and says, I am your God. God comes and goes, and Jesus is on the cross, and we go, then we repent. So the gospel causes repentance. The word creates repentance, creates the change in us. And that is, and so whether you want to say then we make a choice or we receive it or we embrace it, cling to it, whatever human words we want to, you know, try and put on it is fine. But God is the, the worker of repentance. The, sh the shepherd goes and gets that sheep. And now there's repentance. It's, yeah. it's kind of like he grabs us and wakes us up. And then we are, then we realize our need. For yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, we talk a lot about law and gospel in the Lutheran church, but gospel causes us to repent too, not just law. Mm -hmm. I mean, when someone dies for you and you, it's like, whoa, you know, um, 
as Paul says in, in Romans, you know, if someone might die for a righteous person, but yet while we were sinners, Christ died. It doesn't say yet while we were sinners, but we were starting to try and climb ourselves then. You know, it says while we were sinners, he died for us. Yeah. No, because if he didn't find us, we wouldn't know our need. Exactly. Beautiful. Beautiful. So can I ask a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Jim, please do. Uh, have he is he law he has lost one of them in Leeds 99 when he has found it. Now the question I have is does the sheep even know he was lost? Good question. Sheep aren't very intelligent. Sheep aren't very intelligent. And if the sheep knew now, actually, maybe what we should do is save that question, Jim, for the parable of the prodigals. That perfect transition. Because I don't know that the sheep would know, but the prodigal might know. Well, the sheep would know if they're in an uncomfortable situation. Yeah, like where is everything? This isn't, <laughs> this isn't pleasing to me. Or I'm out here and with no protection, but I don't know. Sheep are pretty, I'm told they're not that bright. So I don't, don't think the sheep tried to climb off of his shoulders. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm staying put. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, Jim, great question. Let's the practical sum. All right. Let's read. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Hard stop. Yes. I thought maybe those were the oldest son and the little husband himself. He, the bulk of it would go to. Yeah. That's two thirds to two thirds. Okay. To the younger. Yeah. Yeah, if there were a lot of sons, but but here are two sons. He had two sons, so the the younger is gonna get a third, the, the older is gonna get two thirds. Now all the commentators, although not all of them, but all of the ones I think are credible, say people in the Middle East hearing this would be like, we cannot find any actual description of an actual real situation where this was ever done, where this was ever at. So when do you typically get your inheritance? When your father dies. What does the younger son say? You're gonna die. Gonna die. I won't be here with but you. I, what does that mean? Yeah, I miss you. Wish you that. That is what he's saying. Give to me, you know, hey, why don't or if you were dead. This is unthinkable, this is horrible. The most offensive things as a son you could ever do to your the most disrespectful. Now, what would a typical father do? He would get out the paddle or the rod and give his son a good licking. Or say, well, you're not even gonna get your third now, ever. But look what the, Jesus says in this parable. And he did it. He divided his property between them. <laughs> Not many days later. So now he doesn't say why. He just, you know, I wish you were dead. I just have my third now, please. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and journeyed to a far country. And there he squandered his property in this is important, reckless. Okay. Living. Wasteful living. We're not told that at this point that he's spending it on, you know, immoral things necessarily, but um 
Let's ask the question at this point, what do you think his thought about all this? Because you know, you don't in the Middle Eastern world, you don't nothing happens that every village doesn't know what's going on. They would not have been happy. That's right. They've been like, can you believe that? Oh yeah. This was a wild kid. He was all you know, just like that, just like him, you know. The father's reputation. Also. Father's reputation. It would be like not only gassed at the past, but a gas father did it. Now, if this, yeah, Bill. He's in a different place than where his father is now. But which where his father is, the people around there even know what he's doing, or are we talking about people see this reckless kid coming in there with lots of money and then he's, you know, he's wasting it. So yeah. Is it the people in the town talking about how they're reacting to what he was doing? So the people at the great question, people in the town at this point probably would not know what he did with the money because he's off in foreign land, but he would know that he had money and he asked for the money. So, so now when he comes back is another question. I think probably just thinking that the village would have thought of him as well, that's the lost son. That's, on, yeah. Uh, yeah, they would write him off. In fact, this is the thing we miss. Now, this father evidently is a wealthy person. And do you think that this father's wealth only benefits that father? Even today, really generous, wealthy people bless the communities that we live in, um, even more so a Middle Eastern village. There were Lots of jobs that went along with that household's wealth. And the whole village was benefited by this person. That's the radical thing. Remember the parable we heard where the guy says, I have all this, I have all this. What should I do? I'll build, build a bigger barn. Jesus just totally crashes that might. Because it, again, in the Middle Eastern world, you know, be rich toward heaven, not, you know, towards mammon and wealth. So share what you have. Don't build a bigger barn, you know? And so typically that's what would be done. And even, and here's the other question. In the Middle Eastern village, this would typically go and say, hey, what do you all think? Or what do you think I should do? My, or in the prodigal son here, what do you think I should do with my son's request? Everybody would say, beat his butt. <laughs> you know, give him a time out. Exactly. It would, and so So the village not only is aghast that the son would ask this and the father would do it, but they're hurt. They get hurt because that takes away from the whole village. It, 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 it impacts them financially, it impacts their as well as their sense of honor, etc. Okay, so he heads off and he squanders everything in reckless living. At home, we haven't heard. The older brother yet but he but the village can't be happy everybody's upset her son goes off and when he had spent everything severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need so he spent everything he's in need so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens in that who sent him into the fields to feed Ooh. right Ron unclean animals it's not just that he's feeding the pigs which I've, I've never done it but it doesn't look pretty it doesn't look pigs, pigs that's kind of not the most clean wonderful I want to be I don't want to be in the pig pen um, he's feeding the pigs an unclean animal. 
Well, not he's he's dishonored his father, he's dishonored his village, and now he's dishonored his people by forsaking the law and dealing with unclean animals. This guy, how far, how much worse? Yeah. Um, uh, so he went and carried himself out to the and he, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. That's another just, you would think if this guy went and spent all of his money ridiculously, he'd have made some friends. But now he doesn't have any money. So does he have any friends now? Yep. What kind of fellow is this? People have no interest in him. And now that his money's gone, it was eight. That noise from oh oh they're working on the carpets or something that's good. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't coming. Um, all right. So, I mean, I've been trying to expand. Yeah, um, you know, this guy is really in the. Uh, he's a lost son who lost his mind. He's a lost son who lost his mind. He is, and and how how is he lost? That's that question. How would you say if some by reading the details that you've had. How was he lost? He bad choices all along the way. Bad choices all along the way. Only thinking about himself. Only thinking about himself. Satisfied. Wasn't satisfied with what he had. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Okay, well, I love it. Very helpful. Well, it's kind of too like the, the um, one of the other stories Carol is in there where, um, what, any freaking, uh, any freaking be weary. That's what he was saying, you know, because the bar you may die. But here it's like he was any freaking be weary, but never give any thought for the next day. Yes, right. Living right for the moment. Just, there's not really being a good steward of what he, he the, that he had taken. So, wow. Yeah, just pleasure, happiness, just go for it. Yeah. is he's hurt himself out this. He may be making at least enough money to buy some stuff. Big fee, at least. Obviously, he's a good manager. He was not a good manager. <laughs> Maybe he's been dead even. At least two weeks for his paycheck. Yeah. <laughs> and he may not be making, maybe he's working for room and Or just bored, not even. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, they, they, you know, they didn't. Quite worry about making sure the poor some provision. You know, they didn't glean the poor could glean the fields and all of that. Uh, that safety had there. I guess the point is things got bad enough for him to finally come to push that go back home. All right, there we go. Let's go there. So things are a mess. No one even gave him anything. But when he came to himself. Oh, it is coming from here. Okay. Jim, I, let's see. There we go. Jim, I just I know you got some background noise, so just make sure you unmute when you want to talk. Um so um what does it mean that he came to himself? This is a real wonderful little thing in this parable does it mean that he truly came to repentance and i'm sorry i messed up dad you know i i, I can't believe i did this to you i don't know you decide but he came to himself what does that mean you just got why is this like why am i sitting here eating pods uh, he said how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread but i perish here with hunger 
So <laughs> okay. So this is the question. Which is we're not there though. <laughs> Um, maybe there's a maybe there's a progression here between verse eighteen and twenty one. Let's see. Yes, he came to himself or he came to his senses. Again, it's a little ambiguous. It depends on your interpretive framework, how much slack you want to give the younger son. Um, but let's you could go two ways. You can let me see if I can do it in a real interp way. Let's see. Okay. How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? Um, and here I am perishing in hunger. I know what I'll do. I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called one of your sons. Treat me as one of your hired servants. That sounds pretty shallow, doesn't it? It could, it is what he said, but you could also read it with more sincerity that, oh, I perish here with hunger, but I will rise and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, because I really believe I've really messed up, Father. I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be son. Just treat me as one of your fire servants. Better actor. Better actor, which is true. We don't know yet. We don't know yet. We don't know what. And we don't know what he expects. We don't know if he's just like still in his selfish mode, self-preservation. Maybe that's the way he's lost. He's about self-preservation. Well, we don't know that he does, but but he does know his father is pretty super nice, at least. So maybe he thinks at this point. You know, God, he, my father won't kill me or beat me up. My brother. <laughs> my brother might, and the village might. Wait till you get this detail. Yeah. yeah. He's not giving the father other than selfish because he's hungry. Maybe they going through a lot of rejection by the community. Absolutely. His father's gotten beat. His father's been dishonored. Yeah. Not only by his son, but he's been dishonored by his own choice to give the village a third of the household income, which has hurt the whole village. Everybody's been dishonored here. Absolutely. So, again, I'm not saying you're wrong if you feel that the that, that the son is sincere at this point. But at least he uh, said, make me one of your higher servants. Yeah, he didn't come at back and say, just take me back. Yeah. Come, take me back. And maybe that's a point where you go, yeah, maybe he was more sincere because he's he doesn't he isn't asking to just be restored. It's just like bring me in at the bottom, you know, type of thing, and I'll, I'll be fine. Again, I think you can read it both ways, and I think that's intentional. I think that's intentional in the way Jesus tells the story. Because remember, I'm just going to go back for a second. Why did Jesus tell this parable? Because people were upset that he was hanging out with sinners. Okay, let's just we can't forget that. All right. So he came comes to himself and he rehearses his speech. Now, if you're really sincere, do you have to insert in a rehearse your speech? I don't know. Anyway, again, you decide. Um, but the father said to his okay, let's see. Um, no, we're up here. Uh, and he rose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, now if you do a little search on this, a long way off, I won't put it up there because I've done it so, the search so many times. There's two other places in Luke's writing that that term fills up. He was a long way off. The other one, I don't know if we've had it yet or not. Remember the Pharisee and the publican? or the, the, the tax collector and the Pharisee, and the Pharisee's up in the temple saying, thank you, God, that I'm not like those sinners, and those horrible people and women and 
you know, I'm not like, I'm not a slave or a woman or, you know, all these destitute people. Thank you that, uh, you know, and he's just talking about his righteousness. And then Jesus says, and then a publican, tax collector, stood far off, a long way off. It's the exact same phrase. Now, is it because the publican was just in a long way off physically, or is this a phrase for his repentant feeling? The third place that you see this is Peter is preaching in the book of Acts, the first sermon. And he says, this promise, after he's given the whole story, you know, is for you, your children, and all who are a long way off, are far off. So Luke is the writer for all of this. So, so I can't help but think that this far is more than just a description of geography or how far. I think it has something to do with what's going on for the person. So now maybe after he rehearsed his speech or, you know, maybe he's halfway sincere, maybe he's just in desperation, self, but now he's still far off. In other words, he is, he's not in the in group. He's, he's still far away off. The father sees him. Kim. Isn't that in the Old Testament pretty common to their hearts are far away? Their hearts are far away from me. Yeah, that would be it. I haven't done that search, but that would be a good one. Yeah. Well, Bill, were you chiming in? No. Okay. So, the, there is a practical part of him being far off and why this is important in this story. His father saw him and felt... What's the number one thing that we think of, not number one, but one of the great things that we hear about Jesus as he looked out on the crowds with... Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And I loved... The, the word in Greek, splak, zixomai. That, that's compassion. You got it's gut. You know, splak, zixomai. Um, it's not just sympathy. Or it's not just sympathy. It's gut. It's like, so the father has compassion. Now, again, a lot of things that we hear from our culture, we don't, we don't get. He ran... Okay, Middle Eastern folks, this is a father, this is somebody that's, you know, you know, if you were over 40, you were an old man in those days. To run, <laughs> they didn't wear, I'm not going to run. <laughs> too, too early on the knee yet to run. Um, but, you know, I could start running if I had to right now. But what kind of clothes did men wear then? Did they wear pants? Take his robe. <laughs> Humiliating. Humiliating for a father in Middle Eastern culture to pick up his robe and run. People would be like, this father is nuts. He gave the money. He did that. And now his son is coming home and he picks up his cloak and everything and humiliates himself and runs out there to greet the son and he has compassion on him even after he said i wish you were dead dad he ran and embraced him and kissed him all of this is like like zixomai you know to the nth degree and so powerful and i love this part of the parable the way jesus tells it and the son said to him, the re re rehearsed speech, uh, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Wait. But the father said, the father didn't let him finish. The father didn't let him finish his speech. Now, there's one other little detail I forgot to mention. Why, why else do you think the father ran out to, to greet his son? To before his, his brother saw him. Before his brother? Who? And the village. If the village would have got to him before the father, they might have killed him. He's saving his son's life. With what you did to us, the village just might have put done him in. 
the, the oldest son, we're told, is way out in the field. So he, he, he isn't close enough to come get him yet. So, so the father comes and puts his protection around him, kisses him, embraces him, gets there before the rest of the village. And the son starts the, the rehearsed speech, but doesn't get to finish. Because he, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Let me be your one of your servants. Dad doesn't let him get there. He doesn't even get to say that. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. So now he's got the robe. He's got the protection, see. He, the village can't mess with him. Um, and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. In other words, again, this is all about his protection and his now. Put, put the symbols of his stature as my son back on and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and now is found and they began to celebrate so let's stop there so what strikes you about this or you know um he now he's found but no again I'm, I'm not saying he isn't feeling somewhat sorry for his sins but that's ambiguous he gets there starts the speech god god the father doesn't let him finish and says now he's found because i have taken him back you see how that whole thing about repentance being that God, like the sheep, if these are all three in the thing, right? They're all together. So the, the shepherd went out to the sheep and just got the sheep and brought it back. Here the son comes back rehearsing a speech. We don't know how sincere. And the father comes out and takes him and puts him back. And now the father says he's found. You see interesting yeah well and the father isn't asking him what have you done where have you been what, oh. what how yeah how did so you know and god doesn't ask us either that's right that's grace that's real grace that's not just a little bit of grace this grace alone faith you know so it's grace alone he doesn't wait for the speech to finish he doesn't care you know you know all he needs to hear is, you know, I've sinned against heaven and before you. That's what he needs to hear. Um, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Bill, yeah. An interesting thing to sort of compare this to is this church has been involved with working at various prisons. Yeah. Uh, over the years. And it's, if you've done that, it's really wonderful experience to go and go to services and those yeah get to know people yes watch them respond people welcome them and they're changing their yeah life. yeah absolutely it's so true yeah. when the, the men at our uh living stones uh congregation in the prison in shelton come in and they see people from congregations they're worshiping it's really been and, COVID's done a number on all of that, but um, they're just like, I can't believe you're coming to be with us, you know? I mean, it, it's so powerful. It means so much to them. So I hope we can get back to that sometime. Yeah. Yeah, I... Sir, sir, about the importance of believing what Jesus did for you. Yes. Because it can be hard for us to really to grasp that. Why would we do that? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You know? And so we don't know this kid's motivation, but I can see even if he came in feeling deceitful or, you know, not really being genuine, and his father still puts the room around, loves him. I can only imagine he'd be having the same thing. Absolutely. Oh, beautiful, Kim. And you just made me think of one difference in the speech. Did you catch this part of the speech that he said when he saw his father run out to greet him versus what his rehearsed speech is? Let's see. I th No, he does say, I've sinned against heaven before you. I'm no longer with you. Treat me as lame. So he does say that. 
I was thinking he didn't have that in the first place. But nonetheless, um, you know, yeah, he realizes, wow, my dad is running out to group to, to, to me. You know, I don't even have to go find him. He's you know, he's rejoicing. And it is so important for us to realize what Jesus has done for us. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, let's keep yeah, we'll keep keep, keep sharing. When you when you think about you know, he put a robe on him. Jesus yes. gives us a robe of righteousness. Yes. He puts a ring on his finger. We become the bride of Christ. Right. And he just all kind of ties together. It, and Jesus humiliated himself to come and do that. Moment. Right. Yeah. I mean, you just can't not see that this is a symbol for what God has done for us in Christ. Yeah. And I'm sure it inspired the, the amazing grace, you know. Then he has a feast and eats with sinners again. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. There you go. But what God's going to continually himself, you know? Yeah. And that is exactly what Jesus does on the cross. Yeah. You know. Well, if I mean becoming human. Yeah. And becoming human and then taking the he who knew no sin, taking became our sin. Became our sin. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, see, you guys know the gospel, so you're going to hear it preached right here. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, well, all is well, right? <laughs> now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called to one of his servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And the brother is not, uh, whoopee, yeah, I can't wait to see my brother. I missed him so much. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his son, this son of yours, yeah, son of yours, oh, is that just like, it's like when you have, <laughs> like the old joke with, with parents, you know, and your kid messes up and, and your spouse says, you know, it says, this child of yours, do you see what they've done? <laughs> They're not my child, you know, I mean, so this is not my brother. That's what Moses said to God. And, oh, that's true. <laughs> These people of yours. <laughs> And then Adam said to God, this woman you gave to be. It's been going on a long time. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, now look at his description. So one, you haven't. Now wait, he got two thirds of the property. What do you mean God hasn't given you? All, he says, all that I have is yours. All that I have is yours. What are you talking about? But I've never had a, you know. A goat that I could go and prepare for my friends. Um, now look at his. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes? How did oh. they know that? Yeah. Well, that's what the yeah, that's what the older son exactly. He doesn't know. Yeah. He did now the earlier on the parable wasteful living. It could include yeah. that, but it's it, do, it doesn't say that. But now the older son is going to put it in the worst possible ways. I'm reminded that Luther says that the don't uh, bear false witness. He says, what this means is we should put the actions of our neighbors in the yes. kindest of lights. Yeah. It's not only that you don't lie about your neighbor, you should put their actions in the kindest of lights. Well, if you think you keep the good 10 commandments, well, think again. <laughs> we, we have a shortage of putting our actions of our neighbor in the kindest of lights in the world today. But nonetheless, that's what we need to try and do. Um, so um, let's see. <clears throat> With Prost, you killed the fatted calf for him. Now that is a big deal. That is a huge expense. That is unbelievable. Again, extravagant, prodigal, excessive. Um, and he said to him, son, you are always with me and all that I have and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this your brother was dead not just lost but dead 
and is alive. He was lost and is found. So dead and alive, lost and found are put together. That's powerful. So yeah, please. Well, in my footnote here says that um, in 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 the older son's resentment, it rendered him just as lost to the father, father's love as his younger brother. Sure. That's a good yeah, and so before the youngest son left, the older son has got problems too, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, and yes, that's why I think the best description of this parable is the parable of the lost sons. Yeah. Or the parable of the prodigal father, the excessive father, because he's excessive in his grace. He's over the top. He runs, humiliates himself. You know, he, he humiliates himself just like Jesus humiliated himself on the cross. So, so it, the excessive, not in a bad way, but in a good way with grace. So you can also call it that. But nonetheless, yes, the oldest son is lost. Why is the oldest son lost? Let's talk about that. Give me some descriptions. What's, what's going on for him? He's jealous and resentful. Jealous and resentful, Karen. Yeah, Audrey. Angry, yeah. He's worked hard. He's worked hard. Feels burdened. What else is he then? Yeah, if he's worked hard. What would you say he is? Being a dog. Arrogant. Arrogant. Righteous. Self righteous. Bitter. Well, and now he's bitter. Yeah. Look what I did. Look what I did. What do we call that? Pride. Pride. <clears throat> I did it my way. I, yeah. Can we put Frank up there yeah. at this point? <laughs> Think about the words to that song. Just please don't ever ask me to have that at your funeral. I, will not <laughs> allow I, I, I went through that once. Somebody wanted Elvis songs before. And, and, Elvis. And, that, and he had Elvis singing, I did it my way. It's like, you know, I mean, it's like, come on. I mean, it's a great song, I understand, but it's the epitome of human pride. You know, I just think about the words to that song. So this is the youngest, this is the oldest son. I did all, I followed the rules. And what I get. So what is the oldest son? He's what? What do you do at a baseball game? You keep score. Look what happens in life if you keep score. You will find yourself resent. And pride comes before the fall. And pride comes before the fall. Stephanie and uh, Bill, yeah, Stephanie and Bill, yeah. It makes me think about, you know, how Jesus said, there will be no trade. That, that if you're already with God, that you're celebrating this person who's coming not resenting them or saying, you know, but I'm not going to do that. Yes. So, you were right on, the, on something that's really crucial. What would allow someone who's in the community already, who's not technically, to have not resentment at the younger son but rejoice what would allow someone to, what would keep someone from getting resentful versus rejoicing yeah and thinking if something like this happened to one of them right now yes I had a brother or sister that had done one of these things and then come back i think nowadays we would be happy we would rejoice and i think it's Having this as background with Jesus that sure. changed the, the whole thing around. We would, you know, we wouldn't be jealous of uh, being welcome back to the because we got this story. We've got this story. Yeah. And this story has done something to us. Yeah. All right. So let's keep unpacking what it's done to us. Yeah, Kim. Well, the father says you were always with me and was and it's yours. He is it's he's also an awesome. With what he's had, he's not, he's got, hasn't been appreciative of his life either. Um, and he hasn't seen what he has. Yeah. Yeah. So he's not appreciating what he has. 
Absolutely. Um, yeah. What 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 about this parable that when someone comes back into the fold who's been allows us to not be resentful but rejoice? I think because Bill, you're absolutely right. We live with this parable. We've had this parable, and that's why we would be different. But now let's unpack that some more. Yeah, Robert. Mine is a separate question. Okay. I'm wondering how these people that he's telling this story to accepting yeah how would the audience of jesus accept it let's let's get back to that okay. okay so just give me just think for just a minute what why i'm in the community someone comes in to back to the community who's harmed the community who's done rotten things who um has said to their father I wish you were dead. They cause all kinds of harm. What's going to allow me forgiveness. to rejoice? Forgiveness? How so? Who's forgiveness? <laughs> the fact that God says, I forgive that person. So, Bill, you should forgive. Oh, forgive them. What's that? We forget. So, our forgiveness? Okay, possibly. Yeah. What else? I know it's, it's going to be so fun for me to. You know, <laughs> well, that's compassion. Go ahead. Sure, compassion. So grateful. Good. Why? But why would they be grateful? I, I think this is why. The reason why I can rejoice that someone comes back and not be resentful is only if I get that my being in the community has also nothing to do with how good a person I've been. Because if I'm being in the community because I've done a pretty good job and I've kept the rules, then I will be resentful at that person that comes in at the last moment. I can tell you how many times one of the biggest struggles I hear from parishioners and lay people. You're telling me, Bill, that that murderer who repents just before their die is going to be standing next to me in heaven? And they are offended. That's like ridiculous. And I say, well, it is if you think your being in heaven has something to do with the fact that you've been a good person. See how that betrays that we think that we were keeping score. But if keeping score has been destroyed, and I realize that my being a part of the body of Christ has absolutely nothing to do with what I've done, then how can I be mad when somebody else comes in who absolutely has done nothing to deserve it? But if I think I'm in because I've done at least something to deserve it, then, I, then I'm then i going to, yeah, like, wait, that's not fair. That's not fair. Think of the other parables Jesus has told, the labors and the vineyards. This person works, worked the whole day. And these people came at the last and they got paid the what? Same wages. And they were what? Upset because they're keeping score. Religious communities are notorious for keeping score. So now let's go to Berta's question. How do you think people who heard this parable felt? Let's go back up here. Now the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled. How do you think the Pharisees felt about this? I think they would be like, the oldest brother is right. They'd be judging. Absolutely, because what are they doing? They're keeping sick. They're doing the right thing. You're, and Jesus says to sinners and tax collectors, you can pray to God, our Father. They, they can't do that. Only the righteous can do that. Only the good people. Only the, you know, the priests and these people that are good and all that. They're the ones. You can't give that gift to those, those people. Um, and so here's this person that's just done. You just check off all the worst things you could do. The younger son is done. And a fatted calf is, you know, and the ring and the, the robe of righteousness put on. Um, and here's, I, so what I hear in this parable is, Bill, that's the only way you got into the kingdom. And if I get that, then when somebody else comes in that way, 
Thanks be to God. Another one. Another one. Um, the oldest son would say, "Are you? This is what this is what the parent. Are you saying that you can just go out and do whatever you want to do? Then that's what that's what the rest of the Christian thinks of Lutherans. Yeah. Oh, you're saying, oh, grace, 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 and you can go do whatever you want. No, we're not saying that. But we know that when you say that, we know that we are actually preaching the gospel <laughs> because that's the natural reaction. Now, wait, if God doesn't keep score, then what are we doing here? We can do whatever we want. What does Paul have to say? What shall we sin so that grace will abound? See, Paul, Paul has to attack that. And then he says, Paul, in Romans 6, you've died with Christ. So you're going to walk a new life. When, when you are dead and now brought alive, the good works are going to come. They're going to come because they come not because you're trying to tally up a score now, but because you're grateful and you're thankful. Yeah. Well, it reminds me a little bit about some time back we talked about the disciples complaining because somebody was doing something that they thought only they should do. Right. And, and that, 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 that's good. You know, I mean, yeah. If they're not against us, they're for us, you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And so here, you know, the sun coming back is good. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And um, hmm, we lost some people. Um, so not only do we keep score, we want some boundaries. Where we're on the inside and the others are on the outside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> that that's another thing that religions do you know yeah yeah if we had someone that came from one of the prisons we visit yeah and becomes accepts jesus gift and then wants to come to church we should we should be ecstatic happy absolutely so it's just a wonderful thing like so we should we should be the same yeah. way so when, right be, right situation. and because whether we're no better, yeah. we really are no better if we get this right yeah. than whatever the person who done, you know, whatever. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that all sin hurts the same in this world. There are worse sins than others in this world, but all sin separates us from God. So we're no better. We have, we have, we do not have a leg to stand on. <laughs> None of us do. That is the radical thing. I think this parable is saying. I think Paul says. I think Jesus says. I think that's the faith. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Mary. Does uh, it kind of confirms <clears throat> that we are not the judge of the Yeah. Judge, you know, yeah. We're judge. Not the judge of the yeah. Jesus says, "Judge not, lest ye be judged." Yeah. And if you want God to, if you want, you know, and I sometimes think about this. It's like, I don't want God to keep score. Like, like the people that say, are you sure that this person who's done all these bad things is going to be next to me in heaven and all this stuff? And I said, you know, I said, flip it around. Do you really want God to keep score? You're a lot better person than me. I don't want God to keep score in my life. Uh, you know, so... Yeah, yeah, I think really, um, really great point. Now, that doesn't mean we don't say to your brother and sister, hey, I think what you're doing is wrong, or reprove, correct, et cetera. But judging is saying, you're out. You're condemned. God's the one that does the judging. We don't. Yeah. Jesus says this in the Gospel of John with the John 3, 16, and, and then 17 and 18 after that. If you, if you receive the son, you've already passed judgment. You're not condemned. If you reject him, then that's when that, the, the judgment comes in. So um, it's not about what you do. It's about what you receive and believe. Yeah. Well, he did suffer the consequences of what he did, too. And, yeah. And coming back, he was humiliated coming back. He had to be humiliated coming back. Sure. And that's the, uh, that's a, that's the thing when it comes to the civil earthly world, we are going to experience the consequences of our sin. Yeah. 
And that, because of what you said, Maria, that might make somebody really become because can you imagine you come home somewhere inside him? It's probably just, yeah. And then his thought is almost the other and maybe that would be through repentance. Yeah, yeah. I really do think so. I think that's a great statement, Seth. And I think he one hopes that there's a sense of shame in him and repentance. But then when he sees what the father does, I mean, you know, he's that's that's the ultimate transformation. Just like the shepherd found the sheep, the prodigal father found the, the prodigal son and takes him in. And the, the oldest son, I think, definitely represents you know, those who feel like you're justified by the law, by what you do. That's the way I see it. But there's even another level to this parable that um, I want to get to. But any other any other thoughts here? Um, yeah, Gloria. When our, when our kids were young, and, and we would, if they would do something bad, and we, we maybe if we spanked them, they, they, that was bad. But if we didn't, punished them like they thought they really should have been punished, it was almost harder on them than if we did punish them. Yeah, it's like, please so punish maybe, me so I can get over this. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so maybe the son felt like, he did, you know, that was more than he should. That's interesting. You know, one thing from a sociological standpoint, as they interview kids, you know, who are the envy of all their friends because there's no boundaries in their lives, they can stay out till two in the morning, they can do whatever they want. Um, and, you know, and, and the other teenagers usually are jealous of them because yeah. like my parents don't want me to do this, blah, blah, but you interview those kids that have no boundaries, they don't yeah. feel like anybody gives a credit. That's right. Exactly. So the boundaries, the law is, you know, <laughs> that we're not throwing it out. It has its role, its function, but, um, and sometimes they set the boundaries for their parents. And now they set their boundaries for their parents. Yes. No, I have to be home by midnight. Oh yeah, there you go. And then they say, and that's pretty cool when your kid says, "Yeah, I'm gonna do that voluntarily." Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Good. Good. Great stuff. Now, other thoughts. We got just a few minutes. Yeah, Joyce. One thing. Yeah. Uh, isn't it kind of human nature to be yeah. resentful yeah. of your brother? I mean, and so. How do you get around that? Yeah. I mean, Mary says that we can't judge, but I think I judge people all the time. Yeah. Don't we? Yes, it is human nature. So how do you get around that? You just have to say, so I'm how do you dinner and forgive me. Yes, number one. Uh, one of the big things that I confess as a sinful person is that I do keep score in my life and in other people's lives. And I do get jealous. I, I mean, even my goodness, can I admit this in a marriage? Yeah, right. I think I know. vacuumed the last three times. <laughs> I never, I never think that, Sandy, if you're listening. I never, I'm just coming up with the example. You know, I mean, we keep score as human beings. So, yes, the way you get over it is you go to the font and you say, Lord, forgive me for this. Because that's the old in us. Remember, as Lutherans, we believe that you got the old Adam and the new Christ in us that are going to go along together until we die. Then the old finally is gone. But they're going to battle it out. The old Eve and the new um, Christ in us, they're going to. And so what? how do you put, so really what you're asking, Joyce, is how do I put that old part of me that keeps score, that judges yeah. to death? And the first way you do it is not by trying to just be better and don't judge. The first step is to say, I'm sorry, Lord. I repent. Um, go back to the font. Go to the go to the the supper. Go to the table and receive God's forgiveness. And God will put to death that old. But because it's with us forever, it's gonna get back in there. It's gonna keep coming up. So we do fight it. We do battle it. But the other way is for you to keep reminding yourself that you know what this is. I'll speak to me that I don't have a leg to stand on either. 
that I'm only in because of the grace of God too. So, um, but I also, so that's my response, but I also want to say, I think we have to be careful about saying, I think that they're doing is wrong. Equating that with judging them. I think as the body of Christ, we're, we are going to have standards and we're going to say, hmm, I think that's harmful. I think that's hurtful what you're doing. That as a parent, this is what we do with our kids. I think you're, you know, that's, but that's different than saying you're out. Do you see the difference? So, but now I know sometimes we like, you're out. You know, I mean, that, I'm that, I'm there too. And especially with how divisive our, our country is in, is, you know, kind of place. I mean, the stakes are high. You know, we got all this stuff going on. So, um, but, but so I think the way you get over that is to keep coming back to this parable and be reminded we're actually all the younger son, if we're honest. And we're all the older son. <laughs> we all judge. So that's why we need, and I think, and I think the other thing I'll tell you, Joyce, that I want you to rejoice about is if you didn't have the Holy Spirit in you, you wouldn't care whether you judge. Yeah. Oh, man, that's a good <laughs> you wouldn't even be conscious of it. Because like right now, you're confessing. I'm, I'm kind of like that older son. Isn't that human nature? Yes, it is. But see, that's because the Holy Spirit is in you. And you're like, I know this is a problem. <laughs> see? Yeah, yeah. 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 Mind between discerning. Judging. Yes, discerning and judging, there is a fine line. Well, I think, and when you trip over to saying you're out, you're condemned because of that, I think that's one place where you can draw the line. Let me finish up with this statement. Let's go back to the, to the top. So they're upset that sinners and tax collectors are eating with Jesus. He tells a story about a lost sheep. He tells a story about a lost coin. All the rejoicing over one sinner who repents. You and so this is another story of a one who's repented. I think <laughs> the younger son. At some point, this younger son repents, and it and then you have this older son that's upset. But is there resolution here? Does does the older son say you're right, Dad? I'm sorry. No. What, what, it leaves it open for us. It leaves us open for us. And how many of us have families that are a little dysfunctional? <laughs> that have a brother or a sister that don't get along, or a child that go in the wrong direction, or a divorce has happened in the family. Do any of our families look perfect? And guess what Jesus does to those who feel like Jesus shouldn't be hanging with sinners? He tells a story about a really dysfunctional family. You mean my family can be in the kingdom too? Yes. You mean the fact that everything isn't always hunky-dory in my household? God is taking me in? taking my family in. Remember how I love to do this filter where second person plural is used? And he said to him, son, he's speaking to his son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours, second person plural. Your whole household, son. It's not just yours as an individual, it's, it's y'all's. Doesn't that jump out at you? Like, wait, he's talking to his son, but yet he's talking about a group of people. I think the one more level of this amazing parable is to say to all of us, yeah, man, we are not the perfect family that walks through the church and everybody goes oh man look at that family everything's perfect no none of us have a family like that we have disagreements and we have hurts and stepped on feelings and all of this and some more dysfunctional than others but there we're all we all got that and jesus says you two you two 
you're a part of the kingdom. And to those who are so righteous who think that there's no room for that, Jesus tells a story about a really interesting family. Now, I, don't, I just think that's a side part of this parable. I think we've nailed the main part. God is the prodigal, is God is the father who, you know, I think, you know, that's the gospel. But I also think there's this element that, wow, this is a messed up family and they're part of the kingdom too. All right. What, is this an incredible um, parable or what? Yes, please, Andrea. Yeah. Oh, sure the youngest son is an example of what to do and then but here's the challenge with that audrey He's setting a precedent. What's that? You're setting a precedent. Yes, he is. Yeah. Wait a minute. So yeah. that's why they're upset at the father. You can't bring him back because if you bring him back, you're saying, go and do likewise. That, see, that's the issue that we have when we're, because they're keeping score. See, when we're in that mindset and Paul, when he answers this question in Romans 6, what then shall we sin so that grace may abound? Should we all go like be the prodigal's? So should we all go squander everything? Because we know we'll be accepted back. If Paul doesn't say no, the law says, he says, you've died. He takes us back to our baptism. Because when we die with Christ, then we're not going to be like, oh, goody, now look what I get to do. That's just not where we're going to be. So, um, but hopefully the example for the rest of the village, Audrey, would be to all those other prodigal sons, like everybody, wow. We can come back to God and God will not say, okay, you're out, but he'll give the absolute like the, like the father did. Because why would you come back? Why would you ever repent if you were going to get, all right, um, I might accept you if you work your tail off and get everything, blah, 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 blah. Then I might accept you or, I, or you're going to get beaten up or you're going to be cast out. Why would you repent? You wouldn't. But now we know who is going to hear our confession, you know, yeah. And we don't know if the prodigal son ever changed at all. He could still be the last one. We don't know. It's left ambiguous. The older son, the youngest son, it's left ambiguous in this parable. We want to believe that everything, changed, but yeah. Yeah, I know we got to go, but one quick thing that I just noticed is we were talking about whether the son really knew, was really repentant or not, because he had this kind of, Speech, yeah, but he is given the word. Yes, he said the words, and he was given. He was given absolution. Love it. So, oh, this is so, this is good. They repented, you know, and I think about that when we say repentance on uh. Sunday. It was, I'm, I'm saying the words. Do I really mean it? I don't know, but I'm still saying them and I'm still hearing the absolution. That is so perfect because if the absolution is only going to come if you're really, 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 really repentant, yeah. then when are we ever going to get the absolution? Right. So it puts aside that whole question of, you know, just how righteous you have to be. It relies on the promise. All right, perfect. Beautiful, great work today. Next week, I'm going to tell you, you must be back next week because guess what we're going to do? The hardest parable in the entire Bible, the parable of the dishonest manager. He's shrewd, he's dishonest, he cheats, and Jesus commends him. You better come back for that. All right, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah. Good, good. It, there's so much depth to this, it's un, unbelievable. Thanks, March. Thanks, Ace. Good to see you, Ace.
Here, let me uh, stop the. Hold on one second. We need to stop later.